Routing and Switching Essentials, Chapter 2, Introduction to Switch Networking. We are going to be discussing basic switch configuration and some switch security, as well as some management and implementation. Our main objective is explain how uh, the router boots, uh, discuss static routing is not really done in this chapter, so that's kind of odd. Uh, but the initial setting up of a Cisco switch, configuring switch ports, configuring a switch virtual interfaces, basic security uh, prevention in a switch network, uh, best practices, and how to configure some of those port securities. So, the switch boot up sequence. This is how the switch starts. Once the switch receives power, it will go through a power on self test. It will run through a bootloader. The bootloader performs low level CPU initialization. The bootloader initializes the flash file system. Then the bootloader locates and loads a default iOS image in the memory and then passes the control of the switch over to the operating system. So, to find a suitable iOS image, the switch goes through a few steps. It attempts to automatically boot using the information in the boot environment variable. If you think Windows, think more boot configuration data or BCD. It tries to locate the appropriate iOS image that is outlined in the boot, uh, boot variable. If the variable is not set, it tries to perform a top-down search throughout the entire flash system. It will load and execute the first executable file it can find. Step 3. If the iOS software then initializes the interfaces using the iOS command found in the configuration file, and if the startup configuration is just stored in VRAM. The big thing here is it should be set to find the appropriate variable. So the general question is, how do we set the boot variable? So the boot environment variable is set using the boot system command in the global configuration mode. To verify, you can use the show boot var, B-O-O-T-V-A-R, no spaces. That will show you the boot variable. So recovering from a system crash, if a switch crashes, meaning the switch cannot load from the iOS, the bootloader can be accessed through a console connection. Connect a PC via a console uh, cable to the console port on the switch, reconnect the power cord to the switch, hold the mode button. The system LEDs will briefly turn amber, then solid green, release the mode uh, button. The bootloader should change its prompt to a switch colon prompt. That will be a unique prompt that will allow you to do some basic configuration. Switch LEDs, the uh, switch LED consists of a system LED, a redundant power system LED, a port status, port duplex, port speed, and PoE. And you can cycle through with the mode button to see the functionality of that specific mode. If you want to see what ports are using PoE, you can navigate the mode button down to PoE, and only the ports that have active PoE will then light up. So let's talk about preparing for basic switch management. How can we remotely manage a Cisco switch? We have to be able to set it so that it can connect to the network. If managing the switch from a remote network, you have to also set a default gateway for the switch. You also have to set a virtual IP or a switch virtual interface for the switch. And how do we do that? We do that through connecting from a user exec mode to a global configuration mode, hence the 
config prompt. We navigate to the appropriate VLAN interface. VLAN 1 is the default interface. However, here we're going to be setting up VLAN 99 as an alternate. You assign an IP address. You tell it no shutdown. That basically allows you to turn on the interface. And we'll kick you back out to the user exec mode, and you're good to go. Go ahead and save it by doing a copy running configuration, startup configuration. And that is the basic for assigning an IP to a virtual interface. How do you assign a gateway? You go to the global configuration mode, IP space default gateway, and you assign it default gateway. Here, it's missing the fourth octet. You're going to assign that fourth octet whatever the default gateway would be. And again, make sure you save a copy of it. Let's go ahead and move on to duplex setting. We have two types of duplex, full duplex and half duplex. Full duplex sends and receives simultaneously. Half duplex, it will either send or receive. It doesn't do both. What about speed? How do we set speed? You would navigate to an appropriate interface, and you can tell it the appropriate speed. Speed, 10, 100, 1000 megabits. How do you set duplex? Same thing, duplex, full, or half. That way it would set either full duplex mode or half duplex mode. So how do you know if you're using the right cable? That's always another good question. So there's this feature called Auto MDIX. And so before, when connecting uh, routers and switches and PCs, you'd have to use either the appropriate straight through or crossover cable. And that got confusing because a lot of people didn't know the difference. Auto MDIX actually allows you to use any cable and that feature actually just flips the appropriate port or flips it so that you can use either cable and it will function. So how do you set that? After you set your du uh, navigate to your interface, you set the duplex, you set the speed, you can set the MDIX and again copy one start. So how can we verify if it's working? We can do a show controller, Ethernet controller, go to the interface, physical, and pipe in the include autombxi. That's a huge uh, show command, just to verify. Rule of thumb normally is you use the appropriate cable and you're good to go. Or you're good to go. Crossover for like devices straight through for everything else. A switch to a switch, they're alike. So, crossover. So, here are some basic show command. Show interface will display the interface status and configuration. Show startup config, it will show the current startup configuration. Show running config, that will show the current running config. Show flash, it will display the information about the flash. Show version, show system hardware and software status, show history, there's a history of the command, show IP, gives you a basic IP information, show MAC address table, shows you all of the MAC information that it has. There are a lot of show commands, so do keep that in mind. Okay, so network layer access issues. You can do a show interface, navigate to the interface, and you can start seeing some of these errors. Things like runts, giants, input errors, CRC errors, frames, output errors, collisions, late collisions. What exactly does all of that mean? Runts. Packets that are discarded because they are smaller than the minimum packet size. Giants. Those are large packets. Input errors. That's the total number of errors, including runs, giants, no buffers, and CRC frame, overrun, and ignore counts. CRC. They're the CRC errors that are generated when calculating checksum and when they're not the same. 
output errors, sum of all errors that prevent the final transmission, collision, that's just the number of messages retransmitted because of an Ethernet collision. Lastly, jam signal that could not reach to an end. Oh, that's a lot to say. So troubleshooting switch media. Performer show interface. Is it up? is the interface up? If it's up, that indicates maybe EMI or noise. If yes, remove. Verify the duplex settings. If the interface is not up, verify proper cable is used. Verify proper speed. Once you've done all of that, is the problem solved? If yes, you're good to go. If no, document and escalate the issue. Let's go ahead and move into SSH operations. SSH is Secure Shell. It's a protocol that provides secure or encrypted command line based connections. Kind of like uh, teleterminal, however, SSH is secure. SSH is commonly used in Unix based systems. The Cisco IOS software supports SSH. A version of iOS software includes cryptographic or encrypted features and uh, capabilities. So to enable SSH on a Catalyst 2960 switch, you're able to. Because the strong encryption feature SSH should replace Telnet. SSH uses port 22 by default. Telnet uses port 23. Here is an example of us SSHing between a PC and a switch. You would log in as router. You would authenticate. And that would allow us to connect from the PC to the switch. But how do we configure this? How do we set it up? To do basic configuration for SSH, log in to our global configuration mode, set an IP domain name, IP domain name, whatever the name is. Create a crypto key, so depending on the uh, type of key being used, here we're generating a, a RSA key, uh, key, so crypto key generate RSA, it's going to ask you bit size, normally you set the 1024 minimum, higher the better, and that would generate a key. Next, make sure to set up a user. Username, whatever the username is, password or secret, then whatever the password should be. So password could be password or secret. Next, configure where we're going to be the, doing the logging in. Navigate to line VTY. Normally 0 through 15 is appropriate. And here we're telling it transport input and we're only allowing SSH. We've removed Telnet for this option. Login local. That will tell you that you're going to be using a, a local login. That's this user created up here. Okay, so how do we verify SSH? You can do a show IP SSH and that will, should give you the RSA key that it generated. And if you do just a show SSH, you should be able to see the different uh, connections that are connected. Moving on, MAC address flooding. Switches automatically populate their CAM tables or address tables by watching traffic entering and exiting ports. Switches forward traffic through all ports if it cannot find a destination MAC. Send the broadcast essentially. Under such circumstances, the switch will act as a hub. Unicast traffic can be seen by all devices that are connected to the switch. An attacker could exploit this behavior by doing a MAC address that doesn't exist. It will flood out all interfaces. All these frames reach the switch. It adds the bogus MAC address to its scan table, making note of the port the frame arrived. Eventually, the CAM table will fill with all the bogus MAC addresses. No longer learned MAC addresses, stops functioning. All frames are now forward on all ports, allowing the attacker to access traffic to other hosts and or start overloading current switch. Here's a graphical representation of that. 
we can have the an intruder running an attack tool on max C and it will start flooding the table. Here it will start making a hub and it will start sending out those MAC addresses on all of the ports. Next, DHCP snooping, spoofing. DHCP is a network protocol used for automatically assigning IP address. Dynamic host configuration protocol. There are two types of attacks, spoofing and starvation. Spoofing attacks are fake DHCP servers that are placed in the network to issue incorrect DHCP addresses. Starvation is often used before a DHCP spoofing attack, and that is to deny services to a legitimate DHCP server. Here the graphic representation for a spoofing attack. An attacker activates a rogue DHCP server on a network, then the client broadcasts a request, and then you may not get the rogue DHCP server, you may get the legitimate one, but it can be hit or miss depending on who's closer and who's going to respond the quickest. Moving on, legacy Leveraging the Cisco Discovery Protocol, the CDP. CDP is a layer 2 proprietary protocol of the Cisco. If an attacker is listening to CDP messages, it can learn about all the information on the network. Cisco does recommend disabling CDP if you're not using it. Like leveraging Telnet. Telnet is insecure and should be replaced by SSH. If an attacker is able to capture Telnet session information, it can get information. It can also brute force uh, password attacks, and it can also do a Telnet DDoS attack or a DOS attack. When passwords cannot be captured, attackers will try other combinations. Telnet can be used to test the guest password against the system. So Telnet does have a few options. It's quick, it's easy, doesn't really require a whole lot of setup but it's not secure. In a Telnet DOS attack, the attacker could exploit flaws in Telnet services or the Telnet server. This uh, sort of attack prevents an administrator or other authorized users from managing the switch appropriately. Vulnerabilities in the Telnet services that permit uh, DOS attacks occur and are normally addressed pretty quickly, but they happen. 10 best practices. Develop a written security policy and enforce it. Shut down all unused services and ports when not being used. Use strong passwords and change them frequently. Control physical access to devices. Use HTTPS instead of HTTP. Perform regular backups. Educate users and employees. Encrypt password protective sensitive data. Implement firewalls, and for the most part, keep up to date software. Okay, so let's look through some of our network security tools. What are the options? Well, it's important to realize that there are a lot of tools out there for administrators to test the strength and the security of their network. Things like security auditing is a big one. Security tool audits. That's a huge thing. By monitoring the network, the administrator can access what type of information an attacker would be able to gather. For example, have they been able to see that the CAM tables are vulnerable? Changes then could be then uh, made to the network and the devices to make the devices and the network more resilient to attack. You have to, to check to see where you can go. People always ask, well, why do we have ethical hacking or why do we have penetrator, uh, penetration testing? You have to see where a person can get into your network. And sometimes you may need fresh eyes, not someone else. Another my, a big thing is turning down unused ports. If uh, you're not using the port, turn it off. DHCP snooping. 
snooping specified whether a, a switch port can respond to a DHCP uh, request. For example, are there port, uh, trusted ports? That way you can have some ports not trusted. Or you can trust just ports where the uh, DHCP server is coming in. And you could enable that by DHCP snooping. You assign it the appropriate VLANs. And then you can uh, set the appropriate trusts. Interface Fast Ethernet 01 IP DHCP snooping trust. That would set that interface to a trust. Others could be operational. Things like uh, what MAC addresses are allowed on what specific uh, switch port. And so that brings us to another uh, really great topic, port security. And that's securing MAC addresses and, and the different ways. And you can do that through a static secure, dynamic secure, or a sticky secure. Sticky just means first learned. Dynamic is also learned. Static is manual. iOS does have port security there. There are also three types of violation modes that you should be familiar. Protect, restrict, and shut down. Each mode does a specific task. You need to be aware of that. So how do we turn on port security? Well, when you turn on port security, first of all, you have to do some of the default settings. Port security by itself is turned off by default. Maximum number of a secure MAC address by default is one. Violation mode by default is shut down. The port shuts down when the maximum number of secure MAC addresses is exceeded and an SMTP map notification is sent. The sticky address learning is disabled by default. So you want to know the defaults. That way you don't just turn on port security and you get them unexpected items. You need to know the default so that you know the options that are pre-selected for you. How do you enable port security? You navigate to the appropriate interface. Make sure to set them Switch, or switch that interface to switch port mode access. That way it's in the access mode. Then you set switch port mode security. That will enable port security on that interface. Next, you have to make some decisions. So after you've done your switch port, port security, you need to set the maximum numbers of secured addresses to learn. You also have to tell it what to do or how to learn the addresses. Lastly, it's not here, but you need to say, uh, say what to do if there's a violation. GUI example of verif uh, verification, you can tell it how many MAC addresses to learn, how many sticky addresses to learn. Or if you brought a sticky address that it's already learned, or a static address. How do you show uh, port security? You could do a show port security address, and that will show you the type, the ports, and the MAC addresses they've learned. So how do you determine if they're in error state? That's always a big topic. Ports and errors, the disabled state. It will tell you a port security violation can put the switch in an error disabled state. Port security violation. Port security violation occurred caused by a MAC address, blah, 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 on a specific interface. That will tell you within what it does to that interface. That tells you that the violation, it occurred, a MAC address on a specific interface and then the consequences. You could also do a show port security interface fast than at 018. That give it the appropriate interface. That way you can see the details of that interface. 
Now, how do you bring it back up? You tell it no shutdown, or you tell it shut down, and then you tell it no shutdown. So you administratively bring it down, and then you enable it to bring it back up. All right, lastly, NTP, the network time protocol. You need to be able to set timing. Time sources can be a local clock, could be a master clock on the internet, or could be GPS or some type of an atomic clock. How do you set the uh, NTP? You uh, set a master, and then you give all of the uh, clients the NTP server. So here, R2 is going to be the master one. R2 is going to be that server. This is kind of a typo. It does say NTP server is R1, even though it's sitting on an R2 prompt. So this guy would be the server, this guy would be the master. How do you show the appropriate association? That's going to be show NTP association and show NTP status. These show different items. Status shows the synchronization of the clock, the timing and whatnot. The association just shows the association for NTP. That's actually it for chapter two. I wanted to thank you guys and hope you guys have a great day.